you mentioned like you know later on you're gonna have like the mental advantages over some of these younger players do you think that disc golf needs to continue to push the boundaries when it comes to courses because w- there's certain courses that i'll play and i'm like this is just an execution course this is literally we're playing darts who can who can throw the shot better and then there's other courses northwood black i think is one of the best of where it's not an execution. You're not going to show up and be able to execute every shot out there. And so you're going to be put in a lot of different spots. And we saw with Paul Macbeth, like someone like you talked about, we saw him literally crumble at that course that one year of where it looked like he was just an absolute blender. You're not going to see that at these courses that don't punish bad shots that don't give you risk reward options. So how much do you think courses need to continue to evolve to where we get to see these moments down the stretch of where it is a, should I do this? Should I not do this? Cause to me, that's what really makes disc golf special is can you execute the shot? Sure. But can you also pick the right shot to throw? Yeah, it, it's a good it's a good point. I think from a distance perspective, I'm not sure the courses need to get much longer. Mm-hmm. I think I think it's more of the like you're saying the technical aspects, and basically up until about even till to this day, most disc golf courses use natural design. It you know hey we're not building up mounds of dirt or planting a bunch of big ass trees or anything like that. You kind of have to naturally design the course and then it like work in. And I, I'm, I mean, I can, you know, speak to Milo MacGyver as a great example of that. It's 11,044 feet or something like that, but it doesn't feel that long because players have to execute some really good shots in some bigger fairways with some tight woods as well at times the perfect courses are still yet to be even designed yet. I think they're still coming. I think we need courses that do require a little bit of everything and not just a lot of one thing. And, um, but also I like variants. I like that, you know, one week we're at chess.com and then the next week we're at Waco and it's a completely different vibe. So I, yeah, I don't I, think I we do need agree. to have like super tough tournaments every single week. I still like the no, idea. No, I think you need technical. Yeah, I think you need technical courses. Um, and I, the difference between disc golf and ball golf, and Yuli knows this. Like ten years ago, I would have never said this, but watching a player shoot even par in disc golf is really not that entertaining. I mean, you know, like watching a really hard golf course, Tiger Woods shoot a one down can be entertaining. He's made some good putts. He's made some good chips. Disc golf is really fun when the players are shooting seven to like 11. That is the most entertaining. And I I think that's where we really need to land is like a a phenomenal round should be 11. And a really, really good round should be that seven, eight, nine range, I think on average, in my opinion. I think there's a good place for all kinds of different disc golf because of how, how the sports progress with the long with the long throws. Like I definitely think there should be two, three, maybe four very long courses that challenge that skill. But I also think that there is a place for a birdie fest to where like, Hey, guess what? You're going to have to shoot 13, 14 under at this course, maybe uh, at least one time to have a chance to win. I think that there's a place for that. And I think there's a place for woods golf where you have to go in there and grind it out. Maybe a very scorable woodsy course and then a very hard woods course. Yeah, like nice North Wood Black. I think um, one thing that I really have seen a big trend on lately is, is finding these golf courses so that everybody can watch. And then the course design is making really, really long holes. And that's when I'm like, okay, that's fine. I like that golf. I like that challenge once in a while, but week after week after week, um, I don't one. I don't think it's good for the players. I don't think it's healthy for the players. I really don't. I think that they're throwing too long, too many times. And we're seeing a lot of injuries come out of the sport and it just so happens to be that sidearm injury. And people are like, I hate the argument too, of people being like, well, just don't throw sidearms. It's like, Hey, you put the most competitive people of all time 
in the sport and you tell them, Hey, you have to throw a 450 foot shot sidearm. And that's the optimal shot for this hole. That's what they're going to do. They're not going to be like, no, I'll try to tuck a little backhand in there. You're forcing these guys to push the limits to your body, which I do think there are places for that as well. Just not every single weekend, like weekend after weekend. Um, I also think that like the majors, there should be a woods major. There should yes. be the U S did you see always, and then there should be the world that rotates and maybe another rotation. That's fine too. But I think we need some consistency with the major championships so that we can start building history again of not just winners, but, uh, but golf courses. And I think you hit it right on the nose, Nate. And I've been saying this for years is we haven't seen a good disc golf course yet. There's no good disc golf courses yet. We have disc a lot golf of holes. Yeah. Yes. And we've seen like properties that have been switched from something to another thing. Like my big example is like people kill me for comes. this day. Here it yeah. comes. Maple the Hill, roads, the, the, great, roads. the greatest disc golf course of all time. And I always say, Hey man, that's a tree farm. And on hole one, you throw right down a dirt road to get to the fairway and hold two, you're throwing right down a dirt road. That's not a disc golf course. We haven't had one yet. I don't think, I don't think we've had one where somebody's designed it. We've played a pro tour on there and people are like, I don't care where it is. That's where I want to play. I think USDGC is yeah. close because it hasn't changed that much with the surroundings and the big trees a little bit here and there, but there's something about driving to that course walking up to hole 17 and that just being like, Oh my gosh, this is, this is the USCGC. Like this is the greatest of all time. Kind of went on a little rant right there, but um, I just wanted to back that Dude, up. I love it. No, I love it, man. Yeah. And, and I, it's kind of what, it's a tough thing too, with where our sport is like, you can't, you can't play in Florida one weekend, then be in Vermont the next week. And then in California, the yeah. next week, we have to travel along these roads because everybody's in cars <clears throat> and vans and buses and stuff. And so you kind of get like three or four in a row that are all in the Midwest where it's a certain style of disc golf. You got a couple of, you know, three or four on the West coast. And, you know, cause like, then you go, when we play GMC MVP back to back, those are wooded yeah. and you do see a lot of mid range shots, but it's hard to like nestle those in to a tour, we have right. to kind of play them back to back because we're up there. You know, I mean, and I do agree with you, man. The perfect disc golf course is yet to be invented or even thought of. The, the property is probably sitting out there somewhere. And I know it's because I'm coming back to the Beaver State Fling. This might sound a little self-serving, but I've always said that to me, Milo MacGyver is one of the best properties for disc golf. I know there's a couple goofy holes with some roads and parking lots, but that course really does put uh, the players in a position to throw a lot of different shots, have to enter the greens with some sidearms, backhands, rollers, even. So I think it's a good challenge there at Milo, but you know, that a lot of history that's, there too. That's one example. And there's a lot of history there too. Exactly. Let me ask you this, Nate, cause I think course design and I don't, how, how, how much course design have you done? Have you designed any courses mm -hmm. and stuff out there? I, a little bit. I mean, I, there's no single course with my name on it. I, okay. So no, obviously I on your wife's course side design. though, there's a lot more yeah, course with, designing with, going with Avery, down there. Yeah. And Avery and I always don't see eye to eye with court course design either, but I know a good hole when I see it. Okay. So this is, this has been my take on disc golf. For someone oh, here that, we go. No, for, <laughs> for someone that all, constantly looks at golf, to take ideas or say, Hey, this is what golf is doing. Maybe this is what we should be doing. Right. This is the thing that I think you need to do the exact opposite. Golf is very, this, if you look at a lot of golf courses, drone view, some courses is like one, two, three, like literally just rows. Disc golf needs to get away with throwing par fours and par fives that are straight. We need angles. We need, so like the best, uh, one of the holes that kind of jumps out at me is hole 10 at European open. Now, granted we are throwing over soccer fields, but that hole, the reason why that hole plays so well is because the hole goes like an L the drive is here. And then it immediately goes this way. 
So people, if you want to play cautious, you throw up to the right, throw safe, but now your second shot is so far. Or you try to cut the corner to make your second shot uh, shorter. Like that to me is so more fascinating than these holes that we just have. Oh, it's a thousand feet straight. And yeah, there's some trees here and there that you got to miss. Like I want to see you getting out of position and now you're having to attack this weird angle. And now you're thinking like, should I be super aggressive? Should I just lay up to the corner and try to get up and down for my par? Like to me, there's so much more strategy involved when we stop yeah. making these straightaway holes, even part three, stop making these straightaway holes. Let's start using some curves. The disc can do crazy things. Let's start seeing more of that. Yeah, and and I do what I what I take away from everything you just said is decisions, making yes. the players decide. Okay, what side of the fairway am I going to be on? What am I going to play to that softer side where it's an easier tee shot, but a way longer second yep. with a bunch of OB? Just using ten as an example out there at you know at the European Open, or am I going to get super aggressive? be on that left side inside. And then it's just a chip birdie from there. I love seeing decisions and being on the, on the media side for the last six years or five years. It's like, I, what, what's the best thing to talk about is what's the decision going to be. And then, then it becomes the execution. And I do think that that is one of the best things. And one of the most entertaining things to, to watch when you're, when you're thinking about disc golf, the other thing, that's underutilized real quick, Yuli. Force carries. That, instead of making holes longer, force people mm. again to have to make a decision. Hole three at uh, European Open, I'll use that again since that tournament is kind of coming up. Hole three, the par five, was kind of a pretty standard par five when it just was OB sidewalk, OB down the left. And so mm -hmm. they said, what can we do? They didn't think, Let, well, let's move the tee back back 50 feet. They were like, what if we actually made in the center of the fairway OB? So now players have to think, do I want to chip a little 300 foot shot out there, then go long, then go long again? Or do I want to try to blast my tee shot all the way across? Like these force carries of where, again, if you're out of position right now, in disc golf, so many holes, if you're out of position, all you're thinking is, let me just throw this shot. Let me throw this forehand roller as hard as I can and just try to get as far down as possible. When you start yeah. having these forced carries, now if you're out of position, you got to think, wait, can I actually get over OB or do I need to chip up and then throw over? Like those decisions, that's what I want to see when the pressure is the highest, who can who can make the right decision there? No, that's, uh, th that's exactly what I'm thinking too, man. And I think what talking about like, how late you can play as soon as course design gets to that spot to where there are these things where it's more, not only do you have to execute and throw long and do all those things. Sure. If you go against Ken Climo right now and it's a decision based course, he's going to mop a lot of people up because he's going to make the right decision from the experience that he has, you know what I'm saying? But right now I don't see that as being, there's only one course where he could even have a chance to compete. I feel like, and that's the USCGC. Well, guess what's at the USCGC. There's a lot of decisions that you can, you have to make over and over and over and over again. Right. I think that that's, we need two to three of those courses a year, at least ones that are just like more ideally. It, I feel like that should be every yeah, ideally. Yes. Well, yes. And, yes. I, I mean, dude, to me, it's what, and we're talking about decisions and all these things, but it's also the preparation. I mean, one of the things that while, why a lot of players are able to have success at a place like Rock Hill is because what's your preparation? How did you prepare? Did you just practice willy nilly, go out there, toss and not think about the mistake you're going to make? Or did you, do you have a backup plan? Yes. Like when you get to 10 and you, or whatever, 10 or what, you know, let's just, the well, let's just use seven. Four. Yeah. Is that what yeah. You're talking about? Let's use that as an example. Okay. Uh, I played it. I practiced it twice, nailed the green both times. What's the backup plan if you don't, right? Where do you go? You got to pre-think about all of that because when you get into the pressure moment, 
and all of a sudden you didn't make it inbounds, and now you have to throw a shot that you haven't prepared, that's when it starts to start making mistakes because your mind is not in yep. its normal way. I love so it. I love decision courses. I love preparation courses, courses that require two rounds, two, three rounds, playing a lot of shots. I think that's the most fun once you get into the tournament and once you get into the final round. Now yeah. let's talk another thing that I absolutely hate about course design drop zones. Now <laughs> hole 17 hole 17 at USDGC. We were just talking about it is one of the easiest shots that we have on tour. As far as just throwing something in the circle or 45 feet, it's not challenging at all. The reason why that hole is so challenging is we all know if you do not throw it inbounds, you're not going to a 30 foot death putt. Ooh, 30 foot death putt for Paul. No, you're ha- there's the balloons. You're having to re throw. You're having to re throw. And that only gets harder and harder. So, Nate Doss, what are your thoughts on these stupid drop? Okay, I won't say stupid. Sorry, that's framing the question. What are your thoughts on drop zones where the player never even crossed the water? They threw it straight in the water. And now they get to advance all the way to the green and have a 30 foot putt for par. You know, look, it's rock and a hard place, right? We, if, if you really, if you take away your own personal opinion, you just look at why some of these drop zones are there. It's for speed of play. Um, I hate when you that have, though. but, but I, and, and I'm not, and I'm not saying I like it. I'm just saying that's why they do it. And again, that's why I'm taking my own personal opinion out of it. That's why they do it. Some fields, not all of the, the, the fields on tour are as good as the USDGC. That being said, if you can't keep that standard, then maybe you shouldn't be playing. That's also another hard thing to say, mm-hmm. where it's like you can't just have drop zones where, yeah, you shank your tee shot, you move up 180 feet, and now it's a much easier shot. We've seen that at Northwood Black. We just saw that during the Champions Cup. That happens. Um, and again, I think all of it is predicated on speed of play. The other at, the other topic of that conversation is, well, should the hole be designed differently? Right now that becomes a topic of conversation. Is it a bad design? Why is there a drop zone where you just go to a green and start putting, right? Like on, on hole five at the USDGC, you can't just keep missing the water and walk up to the green and putt. You still have to throw over that water. You should always have to get your disc in you know onto the green whatever regardless but over the history we've seen people take 28s or 26s on 17 and we kind of don't want to see that either so yeah i i get it i get it but also i i'm down with if if you throw and it's a a, a carry move up to the line now it's a shorter carry you got to be able to get yourself onto that green or over that water from there versus just, yep, walk around and now putt. You know, I was at OTB this, this weekend. I missed the yeah. island and then I just freaking, sorry yeah, to interrupt you. You just cast your putt for par. Yeah. From yeah. Like you stinker. Like, you don't wait, deserve I don't. that. <laughs> I just walked up there and made it. That, and um, that's a perfect example, dude. That hole's like what? That's like, like it's three, a 320 foot shot. It's a yeah, 320 yeah, foot shot. And now you got a 45 footer. I mean, and it's just, I don't know. Okay. You know, I have to, I have to address, tough. I have to address some of these comments. Mark just said, Brody hates speed of play excuse, but says the rounds take too long. Mark, <laughs> this is why I hate that excuse is because if it was actually speed of play, then there would be marshals on the ground looking at the scores and seeing like, Oh, there's one group on hole seven. The next group's on hole 11. That's a problem. We should address. They don't do that. No one's doing that. The reason why it's pace of play is because the PDGA says, Hey, we need to make rules, not just for the disc golf pro tour, but we need to make rules for the AMS. We need to make rules for the masters. And they have to have this umbrella rule. Like, is this a good rule to have in an MA three event? Absolutely not. What Nate is saying is that's where it's pace of play. Yes, you don't want guys that can't throw consistently 300 feet to try to land on a 300-foot island. That would take forever. But on the pro tour, we should not be playing the same rules. Look, I'm spitting all over my mic and getting hyped up. 
We should not be playing <laughs> the same rules because the PDJ is worried about pace of play for MA3 people. That's ridiculous. If it was a pace of play thing, people would be walking around making sure that we don't have people playing with four whole gaps like we do on tour consistently from weekend to weekend. Yeah, and you, if you if you think about the PGA Tour as an example, I mean, these guys they get warned by the marshals, and then they eventually get stroked, right? If if you're out with, in golf, it's called being out of position. You're supposed to be within a hole and a half of the group ahead of you. That that's also another topic of conversation that I think ultimately that we will get to is like staying in position, right? If you want to take more time on a shot in the fairway, well, you better putt faster, yes. right? If you want or to take walk, a bunch of time on the faster. Tee, That's what I always walk say. Walk faster. faster. I mean, you, you can take your time, but you better be in position. That's why I think the whole 30 second rule is Dumb. also a topic of conversation where it's like a two foot putt takes a second, one second, a really hard shot with a lot of wind over water yes. onto a small green. You might have a like you might need to take a minute. Now, if you can take a minute there, now you park the hole, you take two seconds to putt. Well, isn't that 60 seconds? Right? I mean, being in position is what golf is all about. And that's why they take away, you know, golfers, they hit tee shots really fast. They put the tee down, one practice swing, they go. I just think you need to stay in position. And as long as you're doing that, take a minute if you want. But if, if you're four holes behind, hey, you're going to start getting stroked because you're just not playing fast enough. Like, imagine if we had good microphone, uh, like good audio on Paul and AB at the European Open. Like, granted, they didn't actually talk that much. If you go and watch that, they didn't really talk at all. But imagine if those two guys were way more analytical with one another. Right. Do we really want, after AB misses the island for the second time, do we really want a 30-second shot clock? of where he's just having to be like, I, Paul, I got to throw. I got, I got, I, or do we want to hear him going through the struggles of what the heck am I about to lose this thing? And sure, maybe it takes two minutes, but like, to me, that's fascinating. That's yeah. interesting. If we can make that happen. Um, someone taking five minutes to walk to their disc when they're their first one to throw or something that I love and shout out to all the pros that are starting to do this. Cause let me tell you, no one was doing this when I first came on tour. No one, everyone would throw their shot and then we would all would walk to the first person to throw and we would all stand behind and then they would throw and we'd all watch and be like, ah, good shot. Then we would all walk to the next person. And we'd all stand behind that person. They would throw. Oh, good shot. Now people are actually separating and going to their disc. And if they're like way far up, they're kind of off to the side. So that way, when this person is done throwing, they're not standing behind them. They're actually already here. And they might have already figured out what they're going to do. Like to me, Nate, and, you, and you're behind the commentary. You know how long these rounds are. Do you think disc golf should be trying to be faster? to where we're not having to ask people, hey, you need to sit down and watch five hours of disc golf with us on Sunday to see a winner. Do you think we could be more competitive with other sports if it's like a two-hour watch? You know, that that's a great that's a great conversation uh, to have. And, and I could use myself as an example. I am a ball golf fanatic. I mean, you know, and so is Yuli. Like, I love watching golf. I'm the guy that's like flipping on the golf channel in the morning. And then when they switch over to CBS, I'm watching the, the rest of the round. If the masters was six, eight hours long, I'm down. I'm down for it. I think there's a lot of disc golf obsessed people that just love sitting down and watching all day long. Um, there are they also have a lot more cameras. They have a lot more cameras. <laughs> true. And it's more, it's more, you can, you can watch a guy play hole 12 while the leaders are teeing off. Exactly. Yeah. So, I do think that pocket is that three to three and a half hour round. That's a really good watch length. I think from, if you're going to watch the entirety of the round, like T first T to, you know, final putt, I think that three to three and a half, once you get beyond that, you know, there's, especially with our coverage, 
there's a lot of just sitting and watching maybe a backup or whatever. That's that's so, my we, point is the backup. Yeah, I, I, we're tough. getting yeah. better. I think we are getting more cameras. We're putting some stationary cameras on certain yes. holes. We're able to jump around a little bit more. I mean, great example, you know, like Champions Cup, um, you know, on that third round when guys were trying to make the cut, we were able to go to some of the stationary Love shots, that. show their scores. I think that made it more of a compelling watch. So do I think we need to play faster? I, it's if, if the round was over in two and a half hours, I think I would be able to still be wanting a little bit more. I think that three to three and a half is the sweet spot. But but Nate, the thing I'm not I'm not saying we should only have two and a half hours of coverage. What I, I know, no, I know you, that you guys can that. have yeah. you can still do five hours of disc golf, but in yeah, those yeah, five yeah. hours, we're not just gonna see one group play 18 holes. We can see maybe right. two groups. And my whole thing is like at OTB, and I, I mentioned this on the podcast last week, there was a fan that came up to me and said, uh, there was a 30 minute gap between groups at one point. Yeah, they were sitting that, yeah. at one of the par threes for 30 minutes, no action, nothing to watch. And that's all in the players. That is 100% on each and every one of us. And that's why this is what just annoys me is there's so many people that think, I don't know what it is. There, what maybe they're just um, they got big egos or whatever. I don't know what it is. You got to stop thinking about you and you got to start thinking about the product and we got to make this faster. We can't be having people play so slow that everyone else is like bogged up behind. And that's the problem. We have like five, six, seven, eight guys that play incredibly slow. And then we have a bunch of other guys that play slow. And so no matter where they are, like we're all screwed. Oh yeah. <laughs> that, that's the problem is like everyone, everyone is screwed. And it's like, and, and we got to look at it. And, and, and that's what I'm saying is that don't walk up to your shot and be like, Brody said, I have to play fast. So let me grab this disc and throw. I'm not even ready. My hand's slippery. Let me no. Look at all the other areas that we can play quicker. We don't need everyone to stand 50 feet away from the basket. When someone's tapping out. If someone's tapping out and you're tapping out, you should be right next to your disc. Like, yes. you, like there's just so many things that cut off 15, 30, 45 seconds per hole, which over the course of the entire round, that can add up to 18, 20, 30 minutes. Like that's big time. All right, I'm done well, with my was, rant. I'm done with my soapbox. Who was incredibly <laughs> slow you when you were playing? Sorry Nate. you had to hear that, Nate, but... It comes out every uh, once in a while. No, dude, 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 hey, man, you know, the, the, the rant you just went on is one that we've, this has been happening for generations, man. There's, there's always been slow players. Uh, I'm, you know, Yuli, I, I've been away from the sport long enough. I ain't bringing up names, but yeah. <laughs> I, come on, <laughs> we want the names. Come on, man. That, that's your guys' job, but you know, the, <laughs> It's it, it's it's a hard conversation to have. All right, so let's bring it into the modern game a little bit. You got Gannon Burr, right? And, and I love Gannon. When when he came onto the scene, I mean, he's getting thirty second calls and like at the tour championship. You know, we're covering it this way. Have you seen Gannon progress in his pace of play, um, Out, or is it just something now no, that somebody he, everything accepts? No, I think he has, uh, he still will take sometimes a little bit longer in 30 seconds for some putts and some shots. But I think again, this is where having more cameras definitely help because uh, when you have eyes on you, it's really hard to cheat. It's really hard to um, yeah. do something take too much time. correct yeah. because now, you know, like he, he knew that he was getting slammed and he doesn't want to get slammed. So he knows this. So he has picked up his game. The problem is we don't have cameras on everyone. So right. well, it, what I think it is for him is a perfect example that a slow player can make adjustments and yes. it doesn't affect yes. their game. Correct. That's one of the things Like you feel like, Oh, it's a hard conversation to talk to so-and-so because uh, you know, I don't want to affect their, no, they can change. They can consciously make those changes and still be a great player. And that I think Gannon is a perfect example of that in a positive way where he has made adjustments, he plays faster, and he's still one of the best players in the world. So he, he's a great I, example. 
I don't think that like this time thing is really the problem. Like you should, I I'm in the boat of like, you should take a little, like, let's go back to preserve when Nico won, right? His last putt, he took well over the time allotted for him to make that putt. He should, it's for the win. It's, yeah. And then the, I get the people in the chat or calling out the chat in the, in the world being like, Oh my gosh. Well, it's the rule. That means that you're cheating. Listen, there is a unspoken rule on the tour that I talk about. And that is some people you don't call because they don't take a long time. And if they go over by a little bit, I'm never going to call that person ever because I, they're in a tough spot. They're slipping down a hill. They can't get footing. What? Oh, 30 seconds, bud. Like you can't, you know, you're, I'm not going to do that to somebody. You're not if having they to have wait like for a, them to uh, get to the tee box I, to get scores. No. They're not. No, no, no. this guy is not a slow player or you get to a last, uh, a hole and there's a decision to make. You got a 30 footer right to left crosswind with OB right behind it. Yeah. That's an important putt for this guy. He has to go through a process of doing these things and I'm sorry, but the 32nd rule isn't a good rule in that situation. Nobody wants to see, like we say, that product of a guy going like, oh, yeah. toss it in the water, four putt. But oh, yeah. That's maybe what people want to see, see that, though. Good. Shot clock, that could be electric. Three, <laughs> two. But, but, <laughs> but this whole yeah, thing. big horns. Yeah. Just, <laughs> <"Arr."> <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else getting worked over from it. <laughs> no, but, it but, but that's something that the watcher at home doesn't see is these, like I'm saying, these unspoken rules. Guess what? I'm not calling every single foot fault where they rotate and it's barely on their foot or whatever, or maybe they might've been off by a little bit. Like I'm not calling that and neither is anybody else on the tour. Yeah. And so when it gets called, it's big news because, Oh, I saw that on the, on, on camera. Why aren't people calling this all the time? It's like a big old thing. It's like, no, like we know when everybody jump puts in the whole world that sometimes they foot fall when they jump putt, like it, they're jumping forward. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. There's, there's, yeah. All these, there's all these unspoken rules where they're like, no, that guy's cheating. It's like, we're all on tour. No, they're not. Like this just happens to me. Cheating, cheating is a conscious decision. Like, yes. If you're going to call somebody a cheater, that means they decided to make and to take an advantage, whether they didn't put their score down right or they moved their foot to where they had an advantage to get around that bush, yeah. that's cheating. I think cheating is conscious. If somebody right. misses their mini in a big ass fairway on a second shot on a par five and it they twist their foot and kick their mini, that's not cheating. That that's just that that is just a part of the game. That I think you you explained perfectly. Yeah. There's a professionalism amongst us. To where we just accept that. But if you watched another player in the woods consciously try to take an advantage, that is cheating. I think there's you get you got to you got to differentiate those two things. I think you can call both. Sure. I think you can call both of them though. One, I, uh, one they're, they're still breaking the yeah. rules. Yeah, still I think breaking one the is rules. way more negative of where you're like yes. that person's a cheater and that right. one broke they broke the rules. And I think. Right. A good example of this is actually Chris Dattar. If you look at Chris Dattar putt the last couple of tournaments, she hasn't been jump putting, and it's no. I don't think it's coincidence that social media started pushing heavily screenshots, slow mos of Chris Dattar illegally putting. Like I think mm. that word got around. I think she saw those posts and was like, "Oh snap!" Like I, my feet are both off the ground. The disc is in my hand. Like, I don't think it's a coincidence that she all of a sudden just went away from her deathly accurate jump putt. And I think that's I think, where social it, media has a huge impact on yeah. how players play. I think it should be considered. That's a foul. Like in the NBA, yes. are you cheating when you accidentally foul somebody trying to get the ball? No, I was actually trying to guard the guy and I messed up. You know what I mean? I'm actually trying to play though. my best disc golf. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, if you get called on it, you get called on it. You know what I mean? But that's where we need more refs. We need people to like come out of their shell and actually, here's my big problem. Don't call me once in a while. Call everybody every time. If you're going to be that person, then that's who you are. And then call it every single time that you see it. No matter what I hate the wishy washy. I'll call you. Oh, well now I'm going to call you and yeah. it becomes like a battle on your card. Like that. Oh yeah. 
I won't say the word what it is, but that's that's a little soft in my opinion. Well, that's one that's one of the reasons why a lot of people of, of all varying levels don't make calls because they're afraid of the retribution. They're afraid of right. now everybody in the group hawkeying them on every single shot. I mean, I've had it happen to me. Again, I'm not going to speak any names, but I didn't Damn. make any folks. I, we want I didn't make any. We want names. Uh, you know, I'll tell you guys afterwards, and then you can do whatever you want with them. But um, you know, like I, I, I didn't make any footfalls after that moment, and that person did. And I, I made that call, you know, a specific call because I felt like that player was trying to take an advantage. They were doing it on purpose. They were in a bad position, and they they took an advantage. To, to, to make a better shot. And that, that, that to me is when that call gets made. And again, I agree with Brody. You can call it every single time. And I agree with you, Yuli, be consistent. Yeah. One of the things you don't see amongst the top players in the world, the players that are playing for the most money for the titles, the trophies, everything. Nobody's on 18, one stroke back, watching them throw, hoping they make a mistake. Well, They're Haley focused King. on what they've they they're focused on what they want to do. They got to do what they got to do, and they just they they believe that that person's going to play by the rules, which ninety nine point nine percent of the time they do. Sometimes I warn some some of these young bucks when they're coming on a card and there's a rules guy. I'm like, hey man, you're you're off your mark a little bit on that. You're going to have to clean that up, otherwise this you're guy's going to get you know? you. No, for real. And also, I mean, last thing I'll say on it. Do you guys? I mean, my opinion is. If you see it happen once, okay, maybe it was just, you know, again, in a big field on a second shot, maybe it happens. If they do it over and over and over and over and over again, I might just say, hey, yo, you're missing your mini. For sure. Just clean it up. I want to see a little bit of effort. You know, that is an advantage. That That is an advantage if you're not having to worry about putting your foot in the right spot. That is an advantage when you're like, oh, I can just put my foot wherever. Right. Yeah. So my thing is, I, did you miss it once? Are you making an effort to fix that? Or are you yeah. just not giving a crap where your mini is, you yeah. know, and that Correct. is an advantage because now you're not worried about your footing ever. So, yeah. Dude, I'm starting, to, I'm starting to use a little tiny mini so nobody can even know where my See it? thing is. Yeah. <laughs> I've, been I got to, like <laughs> I've been starting to, uh, to like look at where my foot is instead of looking at the target. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a couple times where I'll look because I'm like, it's like really shaky footwork, like weird stuff. I'm like looking there and I just kind of throw blind just because it's like, I don't want to step in a <laughs> hole and snap my ankle in half. <laughs> 